Everyone, thank you for your patience uh, and welcome to this evening's meeting. It's June 13th. This is our uh, first meeting of the month of June. We are called to order. Folks, if you could please rise and pledge the flag. There we go, folks. Thank you. And uh, roll call, please, Angela. Saba Al Zayed. Here. Amy High. Here. James Fee. Here. Megan Nolan. Here. Diane Gundrum. Here. Tony Heil. Here. Kyle Shank. Here. Mr. President, I would note for the record we were in executive session from approximately 7 o'clock to approximately 7.35 with regard to personnel as well as contract negotiations. Thank you, Mr. Bellow. Uh, with that, we will turn it over to Mr. Truman. All right, good evening, everybody. First up on the agenda for council approval, or excuse me, council consideration rather, approval of the May 9th, 2023 meeting minutes. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion by Ms. Alzad, second by Mr. Fee to approve the May 9th minutes. Questions or comments from council or the public on those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Then that is unanimous. Thank you. All right. Next up, a mayoral proclamation for Pride Month. Mayor Jack's here. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Obviously, you're all here to hear this proclamation, so thank you. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes out of our meeting to just share a little bit about uh, Bridgeport Pride. So if you'll just stick with me through it, it'll be a wonderful, exciting ride. <laughs> so this is the Pride Month and Lark Bar Commemoration Month proclamation. Whereas the Lark Bar in Bridgeport, Pennsylvania, named after a cheerful, colorful bird, the Lark, was decorated in the Art Deco architectural style with the stencil of a Lark on the wall, the bar itself in the front room was circular and seated 30 people to promote good conversation with an additional dining area in the back room, along with the dance floor to act as a full-fledged restaurant where the whole building would host upwards of 100 to 120 people each weekend night. And whereas the bar opened in 1948 and started as a place patronized mostly by railroaders due to the industriousness of Bridgeport at that time, but began primarily serving the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community in 1952, and whereas it was considered a safe haven for its patrons and went so far as to create the LGBTQ plus forward L Club with a meeting space in the bar's back room in 1956 as a means of allowing members to enjoy their dance space and community without fear of being outed as queer. And whereas the owner provided free amenities to its patrons such as a library with LGBTQ plus focused novels and a space to watch game shows on television to create communal atmosphere where patrons felt protected and comfortable. And whereas its original owner, Olga, felt that through the efforts of those associated with the Lark Bar, more of the neighborhood became more tolerant and understanding of the gay community. And whereas lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer Pride Month is currently celebrated each year in the month of June to honor the 1969 Stonewall Uprising in Manhattan. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Beth Jacksier, mayor of the borough of Bridgeport, recognize the month of June 2023 as both Pride Month and the Lark Bar Commemoration Month and commend its observance to all citizens. Thank you. Well said, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. 
Moving on uh, for council consideration, resolution 2023-15, designating an area as blighted as a blighted redevelopment area in connection with the River Point development. Uh, members of council as uh, and members of the public, as most of you uh, may be aware, we are um, in the midst of a large uh, residential mixed use uh, development uh, being uh, being located along the uh, Schuylkill Riverfront, and <clears throat> as part of that development, uh, the borough and the other uh, representative uh, taxing agencies in the uh, in the county are embarking on uh, potentially implementing a TIF district tax incremented funding district um, within the uh, the parcels that that uh, constitute the river point development and um, in fact, we'll be hearing a presentation on that directly after this. Uh, and part of the uh, TIF process is um, as part of the eligibility criteria is that the property uh, in question needs to be designated as a blighted redevelopment area. And this resolution would uh, memorialize that, uh, that designation. Uh, Mr. Bellow, do you have any, uh, anything further to add? No, I think there would be just a comment that it's not something that is uh, we're doing just as a um, what's what I'm looking for here. It actually is a blighted area, burnt down. For those of you who are here or watching this, don't know the history. The the property burnt down 20 years ago, and we've been trying to redevelop it ever since. And we have some folks that are uh, are working on that project. So it's not just something we put uh, the word on it so that we can move forward with the project. Uh, it, it was that, and it's uh, now it's going to be turned into something uh, much more value to the community. So I, I guess the point there is this isn't just a certain step in a process that we have to do. It is, it's the right thing to do and the right way to go about it. That's correct. And I, I believe that, um, you know, there's, there, obviously there's a, there's also, you know, a negative stigma to the word blight for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, just, just, just a point of clarity, I, I believe this property has previously been uh, designated as a blighted area in, uh, previously when the, a Keystone Opportunity Zone was implemented on the uh, the property probably a, a decade and a half ago so uh, so I didn't realize it was already designated as blighted but my question was going to be what if any effect does it have on um, the neighboring areas in insofar as financial impact or, or something of that nature just that for officially designating it as blighted, although I guess it is already, which changes it. But I, I, uh, Councilwoman High, I don't know that it has any uh, uh, detrimental impact to the uh, the neighboring communities. In fact, wh again, while there's a negative connotation to the word blight, it is, and and it certainly is, uh, meets all the definitions of a blighted property. It is a step towards ultimately better uh, it, bettering the. The riverfront development, and thereby, hopefully, that will have a ripple effect and uh, impact on the property values of those adjacent properties. So, while um, nobody wants to hear that a part of their town is blighted, I think ultimately it it's going to be a, a harbinger of uh, better things to come, finan finance-wise. I had a quick question. Does that mean that whenever it's developed, does it switch back to like a regular? Is there a point where it goes when it's developed? Does that change the status? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, with those good questions in mind, I, I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, resolution. I'll second the motion. The motion is from Mr. Heil and a second by Ms. High for the resolution designated the area as a blighted development in connection with the, or as a blighted redevelopment area in connection with the River Point development. Questions or comments from council or the public on that resolution? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, that is unanimous. Thank you. All right, very good. Thank you. Yes. All right.
right, next up on the agenda for council consideration, resolution 2023-16, approving participation in a tax increment district within Bridgeport Borough in connection with the River Point development. And um, with that, I would ask if uh, Mr. Maris from PRDC uh, wishes to come forward to further elaborate. that good? Uh, that's better. <clears throat> now I can hear myself echoing. <clears throat> Sorry for all of you. Uh, my name's Tony Maris. I've met, I think, everybody at least once before. Uh, thank you for having us tonight. Tonight's kind of an update on the uh, status of the project overall. Um, if you drive down and coming into Bridgeport Borough from Conshohocken and you happen to come down Vine Street, you can see a lot of the progress. It's been a pretty good view. Um, good news is we are all the way done importing all the dirt uh, there'll be a little bit at the end, but it was about 28,000 truckloads that we brought in since uh, starting on Labor Day weekend. So thank you for the borough's patience and cooperation in getting all that done. When we first came to you, uh, I guess back in 2019, we talked about possibly uh, having a TIF district created. And there was a lot of effort put into that with uh, the county and the school district. Um, the school district has voted to support the TIF, but not participate financially. Um, they did participate by contributing the excess dirt from the Upper Marion High School. So by doing that, we saved them some tipping and disposal fees. Um, about a, uh, they contributed half the dirt, about 140,000. Well, they contributed 140,000 cubic yards, about a third of the, the total amount. Um, at 100 bucks a truckload for them, they saved some money. We also got the dirt, which helped us bring the site out of out of the ground better. We found the rest of it from PennDOT and its ongoing road expansion. But really what we're here tonight is talk about what this project means to the borough and ask you to consider things. There's some steps you have to take tonight, which we've gone over with Mr. Truman, but then there's also um, some steps I'll be back in two weeks, and then there was a TIF district and enactment and some other things we have to do along the way procedurally. But importantly, as council considers this, when we first came here, this property was producing about $70,000 in gross fiscal taxes to the all three taxing bodies, school district, county, and the borough. The net fiscal benefit of this project to the borough alone, when built, um, is about $2.4 million annually. That's considering all new expenses and, and, and all, uh, about 1.4 1. million, 1. million in net fiscal benefit. On the TIF, on the TIF, we proposed a couple different scenarios with council, one of which was 100% participation, um, 50% participation, which is where we kind of modeled this out, and there's a TIF plan that's been circulated to everyone. It's a public document now. Uh, proposing how that TIF would work, and what we're proposing is that the borough and county, in creating a TIF district, would pledge one half of the tax revenue from that project. The benefit of a TIF is it does not limit or impact your other, other municipal borrowing capacity as regulated by state law. So if the project doesn't fund, the borough doesn't have to come into its excess coffers. The other thing that's a benefit is that the, essentially the, the taxes from the development self-finance the improvements to make the development work. So to give you an idea on cost, when we started this, our estimate for site improvement work, this is pre-COVID, was about $16.5 million. We're pushing $23 million today because of the cost increases. We needed a TIF to do this at $16.5 million. We really need the TIF at these numbers. Some of it's because of design changes that we had to do to accommodate DEP. Some of the things, some, some site conditions we found. Um, we thought we had some sewer routing reworked out. We had to rework that out two times now. Um, so third time's clearly the charm. Um, you know, so we've had some extraordinary costs, and those are outlined in, in the TIF. But it, to give you an order of magnitude, um, the wall that was built was $2.2 million. The dirt that was to be brought in and have to be placed has a value, if the school, especially if the school district hadn't participated, of roughly $12 million in cost. I mean, we still spend several million dollars getting it placed and compacted and tested and everything like that. There were sewer infrastructure and stormwater infrastructure benefits, and part of the benefit of this project, and we've gone over this with Mr. Woyden in great detail, 
is that in the normal storms, putting aside the idas of the world, um, this project will help Bridgeport Borough because it's going to help take all that stormwater that's hitting front and depot and those low areas down there and get it out to the river so it's out and away. The stormwater system that's built will have backflow preventers in it so the storm system will not back up into the borough the way it does in other instances or top over, over the river. All the homes that are built will be out of the floodplain so those homeowners will not have to take homeowner's insurance. And more importantly, as, as tragic as Ida was, it afforded us the opportunity to model the project using the hydrology that we knew it happened as a result of the storm, taking measurements, and we were able to show that this project, when built, would have no negative impact on this side of the borough, and across the river, the river would have risen 0 0.01 feet in, the, in, this seg in this segment. So we got a bunch of ground that's not taxable now, raised and created as taxable. Um, we get a bunch of ground that people would have had flood insurance if they built something, that they don't have to do that now. Um, and, you know, it's one of the few opportunities as a developer I get to stand here and say to you, we got to make new ground. And creating new ground created will create about 1,100 new residents to the borough, will increase the borough's population between a quarter and a third. Um, obviously, there's a fiscal benefit. But even at taking, and I want to be clear about what taxes that we're talking about, we're only talking about real estate taxes. Your earned income tax, your transfer tax, your uh, uh, service, uh, what's the uh, municipal services tax are not affected by the TIF. The pledge from the county and the borough is on 50% of the tip of the taxable real estate ta of the real estate taxes collected. When we did our modeling, uh, we modeled this project assuming an outside sales price on the home is about $299,000 on average. Given the economy and some things that have changed, the average sales price is probably going to be over $400,000. But we kept the modeling in our plan conservative so that when we came to you and came to the county, we could say, you know, we, we've modeled this very, very conservatively. Um, benefit is, is that there's more tax revenue, obviously. The debt can be paid down quicker or there's more excess available to the borough. Even under this model, um, the... Total annual net surplus, even pledging, servicing the debt, um, is about $354,000 a year in three years. And over the 20-year the life of the TIF, there's a $6,453,000 surplus created. And in year 21, the surplus to the borough alone, tax revenue to the borough alone, across all revenue, is... About six, about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, this project's transformational in a bunch of ways. Um, we are at a critical stage right now. Um, the wall is almost complete. Uh, the infrastructure is almost finished in terms of some subterranean stuff. But you know, we've we've still got a third, you know, about a half the lots yet to get improved. We've got some stored water improvements we have to do yet, um, and to complete those. Um, we're gonna. We need this TIF. I mean, it, it, if we don't have it, um, you know, the, the project's got, you know, serious just issues. I mean, we when we started this, I think we had estimated our return would be with, without a TIF would be somewhere between six and eight percent, and with the TIF it was about ten percent. Um, with the TIF now and the cost increases, we're probably in the eight to ten percent range again, um, and we're you know we keep getting hit with cost increases every time we we turn around, duck the iron pipe, and we bid the job to relocate the upper Marion Force Main, which was an extraordinary cost, was eighty-two dollars a foot. We bought it at one fifty-six and thought we got raked over the coals. It's one hundred eighty-seven dollars a linear foot today. Concrete is up, uh, lumber is down, but we're not doing a lot of lumber part of this. But the other part of it is in order to finish the wall, it's where the apartment building goes. Um, and that's 250 units in a modern style apartment building um, that we came back to the borough for zoning relief for. So tonight really is the culmination of two years of effort and to bring you a cost budget that we know is solid, um, that we wanna be able to draw against, hopefully this fall. The bonds will be issued as tax-free municipal bonds. They'll be, issued, they'll be institutional quality uh, the RDA will be the sponsor of those, the Montgomery County Redevelopment Authority. We've had meetings with them. I have a meeting with them on how to be rescheduled from tomorrow for a personal matter for me. Um, we're having that meeting now on Friday. The county commissioners, this type of information session will be with them on Tuesday. 
and then their official vote will be on the 29th if they're in support. And then there's some sets that we have to come back with you in terms of get, get enacting the TIF district, and, and that there's something called the NID. Um, and also, I think it's important for council to know that because we underwrite this conservatively, there's a $25 a unit NID that will be collected by the HOA and submitted and as a credit enhancement. Given the sales pace, we probably will not need that, but it's there as a credit enhancement. So much like we've made an investment in this community, we're asking you to make an investment in this, in, into this project in this community. We're also asking the residents who move in that if the credit, if it's needed for credit enhancement, they're making an investment in their new home in their community. So this is really a partnership amongst all of us, and it's an opportunity to take, like I said, something that's producing $70,000 of tax revenue and that's part of the reason it was blighted. Um, it, it was underutilized, it was in a floodplain area. Um, that's why that designation from before was important. But this redevelopment um, has been what, you know, everybody tried to do for 18 years before us, and we're this close, and we're asking for your support tonight for the TIF um, because we need it. Thank you. Any questions? And just for the record and for folks listening, this isn't this TIF request um, and this process isn't something new. We've we've been in conversations, I don't know, at least six months over the TIF. But then again, my a year, I don't know, it's a post COVID brain. It's been a while. Um, and and I'm glad it's coming to fruition. Uh, maybe Keith, I know Tony presented some of the numbers as far as hundred percent, fifty percent, what those meant. Maybe um, just a quick summary sort of in, in layman's terms as far as what what this means again, just for the just for the public, right, and for folks that are watching here. Sure. Um, uh, you want layman? You've come to the right place. Uh, in in short, a TIF is borrowing against future tax revenues generated by whatever the in the whatever the ultimate improvement district is, whether it's a, a quarter of your town or in this case, um, a handful of parcels uh, with a, you know, a specific development in mind. Um, each taxing, each involved taxing agency, the school district, the municipality, the developer, and the county have the opportunity to um, obtain money uh, up front um, in order to do any you know, certain public improvements that technically should be germane to uh, the overall uh, development of the project. I think that's a key point. I think that's what I was hoping you were going to get to, was yeah. the, uh, the, the borrowing against this TIF district and against sort of the tax abatement portion of this is for benefits for the public good. Not, we're not buying your concrete for you with this money. This is, this is something that is a benefit for the borough. So it's for infrastructure. It would be allocated to infrastructure. And it has to be infrastructure that was put in place within six months of the, the last vote there was an authorizing resolution that has a look back window of six months. But for example, um, stormwater improvements, water distribution, sanitary sewer improvements, roads, um, part of the retaining part of the retaining wall being installed, placement of dirt. Go ahead. Sanitary sewer benefits the town how? So, I, I think massively, but explain how. So there's a, there's a number of, of issues, and Mr. Voiden might be more well versed in, in sanitary uh, sewer knowledge than, than I have, but at a general level right now, the borough has a combined sewer system, which means your stormwater and your sanitary system flow into a common system at varying points throughout the borough. We are in part decoupling part of that system. Um, there's improvements in Front Street that will connect, or they'll make a penetration under Nor the Norfolk Southern Rail Line. We have to work with the borough on that to get that done because Norfolk Southern's a real easy group to get votes through. Um, and then the, borough, the project itself right now, which currently not only floods, um, and you have that issue, but all the stormwater runs down there, and if you've never been on site and you ever stood on Front Street in a big enough rain, it lifts the manhole lids off of the manholes and floats them away and all the toilet paper and combined sewer overflow flows back down into the Schuylkill. Um, we will segregate that part of it. This development also will drain in and directly drain back out into the Schuylkill. And the way we've designed the system is um, it will get the stormwater out ahead of the other storms that are from upriver. So as that was held and detained for 24 and 48 and 72 hours, our stormwater will be out, out ahead of that, and then there'll be backflow preventers. So in the average storm, that's why I said all the water that runs down, and if you've ever been on Depot Street right around front or second and a heavy enough rain, 
you can lift the manhole covers up there as well. So this will help abate much of that system and take some pressure off of the CSO, which in the long term benefits the borough under its long term connection management plan with DEP. Um, so it's part of that decoupling. Um, again, storm just regular stormwater sanitary improvements. Go ahead. And then the wall is going to create trail. Correct. Uh, unusable space now is going to create trail for the benefit of the entire borough as well. There's a trail. Um, there's a park. There's a park, uh, public park that we built. There's a dog park that will be built now outside there. There will be an ADA accessible ramp at the eastern end, this end of the job. There will also be a, uh, there was a ramp proposed before. We now actually have a direct access on a drive lane, which will bollard, which will be 10 foot wide of asphalt or concrete going down to an eight foot wide trail, which your police off, your police and emergency vehicles can use. Um, Pico can get down there to service the lines. As part of this, we're also replacing a number of Pico poles as part of their distribution network. Uh, we made improvements to traffic signals at 4th and Ford. So there's a, a lot of, pieces to this in terms of what constitutes a public improvement, but it's really for anything that benefits the public, just not the development. So I'm not using, the money's not being used to build houses, the money's not being used to build an apartment, it's being used and allocated for infrastructure. And the most important part of the infrastructure is the, the, the placement and compaction of the soil, which takes this site out of the floodplain. Um, and that's been a, a, a huge, huge undertaking, um, but is, is necessary to develop the site. Thank you. That's exactly what I was trying to get at. Yeah, I appreciate. I, I know we, I don't want to stretch this out any longer than we have to, but I appreciate that explanation. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, one thing I just want to add, and I appreciate working with your group, um, a lot of times you see in cities where there's a sports arena or something coming in and they demand, they make all these demands before they put a shovel in the ground. And not that you're coming in with demands, but um, instead of waiting and waiting for a council to approve things, you've already put in so much money and sweat equity and time into the project. So, I mean, everyone could see it, but I think that uh, hopefully other developers will see that elsewhere and see that, yeah, you if you put your money where your mouth is, you'll get the community buy-in to do it because we've heard a lot of false promises about this development and other things in the past from other places, and this is the opposite of that. So we appreciate that, that working relationship. Well, thank you, Mr. Heil, and I can also say from a the many a developer will stand before you and say they've heard promises from governing bodies where promises weren't delivered. And this has been, in my experience, and as you can tell by my hairline, I've been doing this for a little while, um, about six months with this hairline. Um, <laughs> um, the, 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 the reality is, is that at every step and turn, there, there, there was, we had an interest and you had an interest, and we, instead of fighting about it, we found a way to work together and bring about a solution. And that's really the testament that this project stands for, is that there can be cooperation between developers and municipalities as long as there's communication and there's a reasonable approach taken and you, you've done that and it made it easier for us to make that commitment to you. And I'm proud to stand here and say, you know, over these years, we put more money into that project than everybody in 18 years ahead of, behind us. Um, and this is the start, I think, of a lot of great things for the borough, um, you know, this project isn't really even, quote, on the map yet. Lennard just dug their footings. They'll be starting framing those houses. They settled six more units with us today. In two weeks, they settled six more. Um, in four, three weeks after that, they settled 10, 11 more. And so there'll be momentum. And just to give you an idea, by December 31st of this year, Lennard is on pace to settle at least 100 lots with us. And if we get this TIF done and we're able to complete all the improvements, all of the lots will be fully improved by April or May of next year, and we'll just be waiting for Lennar to finish building them. So that's really, you know, the start of things. Like I said, when we're done, I think we'll have about 1,100 people added um, to, the borough, to the borough's census. Um, and that's good for every business up and down Fort Street. That's good for, for everybody. But it couldn't have happened without th this council, its cooperation, and your staff. Um. Oh, but, but, well, yeah, sure. Well, should we get a motion on the table first? Yeah. Okay. With, with that in mind, obviously, we've gone over the TIF many times. I don't think there's any new confusion to talk about, right, Mr. Bella? We're, we're where we were. So I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2023-16, um, approving participation in the TIF. I'll second. 
The motion is from Mr. Heil, second by Ms. Nolan, to approve the, uh, the TIF district for the Riverpoint development. Uh, and before we move forward on the vote, any uh, comments from council or any other comments or questions from the public in support or uh, otherwise? I had a quick question too, just um, sorry not to believe with the topic, but could you talk about just a bit, the, the new homeowners that are gonna buy uh, the property, what financial responsibility do they have around this? I know we talked about it, but I just wanna make sure that everybody understands that. So they have an obligation to pay their taxes, and then there's an additional assessment of $25 a month that can be, up to $25 a month that can be assessed against it if it's needed. So um, the TIF as it's written has a uh, borrow amount to us. It has interest reserve fees, costs that all get paid through the TIF and get repaid. If um, sales pay slows and we take an extra year, the TIF, would, the, the, the NID, it's called the Neighborhood Improvement District, would kick in and require that $25 payment to supplement that payment. So they, they are vested in that number and that's disclosed to them when they buy their homes as part of their underwriting for it, so it's not a surprise to them. But most importantly, if this had just been a municipal borrowing effort in order to do, build the wall and, and do the, that would affect your municipal borrowing cap capabilities. So the benefit of this is, is twofold. Um, is that one is that you know someone else is doing it and you're, you're the, there's someone's financing on the basis that they believe the project's coming and from our standpoint most TIFs that are done it's, it's, it's a field of dreams um, someone's starting to say hey there's this brown field or this green field and we want to develop it from an underwriting standpoint it becomes very easy to say to someone they've settled by the time the TIF gets funded let's say in September they've settled 80 homes to a national home builder they've put 16 million dollars worth of infrastructure in your risk becomes much lower, and it's a 20-year municipal bond tax-free return to the to an institutional investor. Just for clarity, though, from the taxpayer's perspective, all they're going to do is pay their taxes like they always yep. do, and there's the possibility of the extra $25, but from your perspective, all, all they know as a homeowner is they have to pay their taxes. Where the money goes changes. And more importantly, no other taxpayer in the borough is being asked to support this development. This, so this is an opportunity to, to self-contain this and to have benefits overall without putting any burden on, on the general taxing authority of, of, or in any of your taxpayers in the borough. It's, it's really borne by the new residents. It's, paid, it's borne by their new taxes. It's borne by the NID if they have to. So it really is it's, it's a very unique way to create another type of public-private partnership to get projects done. Thanks so much, I appreciate it. Thank you. Before the vote, any uh, additional questions or comments? We do have a motion on the floor. All right, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that's unanimous, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Probably worth saying again, Mr. President, that it does not affect any other taxpayer in the borough. It does not affect any other taxpayer in the borough. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Um, I think another good point of clarity is the, the borough is not borrowing or drawing down as part of this, yeah. so. Uh, one, one question based on what Mr. Maris said is um, they're going to the county. Do we wanna have any representative from Bridgeport attending that county meeting in support of this? Uh, there, yes. You want to be there? Yes, sir. I think um, I think it's obligatory, actually, for for a borough representative to be there, sir. Yep. All right. Well, uh, thank you all, Mr. Maris, Mr. Perlman. Uh, moving on, we have a sketch plan presentation. Uh, another uh, another development in the pipeline uh, for three thirteen West Fourth Street. And I see, uh, I see Ms. Zarrow here. I see uh, some of the other uh, stakeholders. So please, come forward. Good evening, everyone. Allison Zarrow on behalf of uh, the owner of 313 West 4th Street. Um, 313 West 4th Street is uh, where the current Arnold's office furniture is located. So just to probably orient everyone sort of at the very beginning, um, we have a full team with us tonight. Standing behind me is Brandon Klein from the Geist Companies. Uh, the property owner has 
partnered with Brandon and he has a full sketch plan that he's going to go through. We also have our civil engineer with us, Greg Newell and Jordan Berkowitz, who is one of the two owners of the property. Um, Jordan and his father have run their business on that site for many, many years and they are looking to redevelop the property. Um, and I think it makes sense to have me turn it over to Brandon and walk you through conceptually what's proposed here. I will note that the property is zoned LIC district. We are proposing multifamily, you'll see tonight. Currently, your LIC district only allows that as a conversion in existing buildings. We are proposing a new building, so I did want to sort of set that up in, in a context, and we also have a sketch plan review from Mr. Woyden that we can go through after Brandon walks through his presentation. Thank you, Allison. Uh, my name is Brandon Klein with Guys Companies. I'm the Vice President of Design for uh, our company. Um, our company is a, a developer and a design builder, um, so we have in-house architecture engineering uh, along with a development team that's partnering and working with um, Jordan and, uh, and, and, and Jay uh, on this project. Um, I would like to hand out um, just a clarification to the engineering report that was provided for the sketch plan. Just So um, as mentioned, this project uh, would be a complete redevelopment um, of the existing site. Um, the existing site currently has a, a one and two story uh, warehouse that uh, has been on this property for, for many, many years. Um, and the project would uh, be a demolition and raising of that building uh, to create a, a, new, uh, a new development. Uh, the development would be six stories overall, um, 70 foot in height. Uh, the ground floor would have a lobby and a amenity, small amenity area, uh, along with uh, five, uh, five stories of podium, or uh, that would be a podium and the five stories of residential above. Um, the project would entail 156 apartment units um, and 190 parking spaces. So uh, we always like to talk about the framework of a project. Um, three items that are obviously a large portion of the um, liberties that we're taking on the design of this project. One is the uh, proposed use variance. Uh, our hope is that the borough would look at this as a use variance, not a need for a rezone, but a use variance um, uh, to allow for uh, the multifamily use within uh, this district. Um, another item is a parking variance. Um, the proposed uh, development would uh, account for a one parking space for efficiency and one bedroom dwelling units and a one and a half uh, cars per unit for a two bedroom uh, unit. Um, opposed to the uh, two per parking space requirement uh, in, in the current code. Um, nationally and within the market, we are seeing a lot of people, um, especially with these smaller residential units, not necessarily always having two uh, occupants per unit, not having that need. Multifamily projects, you'll start to understand too that there's kind of a, an ebbs and flow of arrival and time stayed. You know, people are in the medical community, they might be second shift workers, third shift workers. Um, and don't always come in like an office building where it's nine to five every day. Um, so uh, we find that uh, this parking count uh, would be sufficient for the development proposed. And then additionally, um, this uh, street is really a dead end street that's been kind of cut off from the urban planning perspective of what you know the condi current conditions are. And there's currently about 50 on street parking spaces that are directly abutting this property uh, on 4th Street as well. Um, so from those aspects, we feel that we're more, more than within uh, the allotment of required parking demand um, for that. Um, and the last item to just talk through on the project has to do with minimum dwelling size. Um, one of the things that we see in a lot of zoning codes and zoning ordinances has to do with minimum dwelling sizes aren't really up to today's standards. As everybody knows, furniture has gotten much smaller. Televisions, most specifically, have gotten significantly um, you know, shallower. Um, which allows for someone to live in a smaller apartment building or apartment unit um, and be able to have the same lifestyle that they used to, that used to be a 36 inch deep t uh, tube TV. And so that equates to s uh, space saving. So um, what we find obviously uh, with some of these studios or one bedroom efficiency units in the 600 square foot setting, 
um, they're more than sufficient to allow for a true one bedroom size by industry standards and still allow for the furniture and arrangements that would need to have uh, a, a normal size living. Um, so we are asking for a, a variance that uh, will be uh, allowing for a studio unit, which currently is not allowed um, within uh, the code, and then uh, some one bedroom efficiencies uh, and smaller one bedrooms that are uh, you know, in the 700 and 600 square foot sizes. Um, currently in the code, it's a uh, not permitted for studio. Uh, one bedroom must be a minimum of 800 square feet. And in industry standards, that's extremely large. Um, and then two bedrooms, 1,000, which is actually pretty fair. So it's not really uh, equal uh, a one bedroom to a, uh, to a two bedroom for industry standards. Um, and then in the letter, there was just some clarifications. Building height, we didn't have noted. It's 70 feet. It's uh, within the allotment of 72. Um, building setbacks are all compliant within 15 feet, uh, which would be compliant for the area. And then uh, we provided some building density and impervious areas, coverage, lot coverage areas uh, that also demonstrates compliance. So um, I believe everyone has the packet and design presentation that we put together and put forth intended to kind of evoke some discussion. Uh, the building is not designed from a facade standpoint, but I will say that the intention of this, you know, the existing area of this building has a lot of root foundation of industrial um, and warehousing with a lot of, uh, you know, history in that. Um, so the idea that we want to invoke on the design of the exterior of this building is to kind of pay homage to the industrial roots of the area uh, and in this di direct vicinity, but while still giving a, a scale and context of a residential building. So there'll be a little bit of a blending of the two uh, genres of architecture in the final design of, of, of the project. Um, so happy to answer any questions. Um, I believe that this is meant to be more of a work session. So um, we're very excited about this project. I don't know if Jordan, you have any comments that you'd like to bring up to the board before <laughs> opening the floor? Hi, how are you guys? Um, no, nothing major, I would say. Actually, uh, I don't know if David remembers this, but David was in our building many moons ago uh, talking about redeveloping. And I don't think we were quite a large enough project for his scale. And also, I don't think we were quite ready. Um, but since then, we've been in the office furniture business, as you know, down the street for uh, close to the last 20 years. My father, who wishes he could be here tonight at a trade show, is probably one time a year that he couldn't make an, a meeting, but would love, we'll be at the next one, um, has been in this town for 40, over four, about 40 years now. So <clears throat> it's near and dear to our heart. It's the only town I've worked in since you know, I started working. And um, you know, we, we did well during COVID. We jumped into the medical supply business to uh, pivot from the office furniture business. Obviously, it was a struggle during uh, COVID. People weren't in offices. And um, long story short is we're kind of headed towards the end of that journey and we've been getting into real estate in recent years and um, really looking to sink our teeth into a good project with, with our own money and our own uh, resources and you know why not do it in a better place than where we've been the whole time in Bridgeport you know we've been approached by developers many times over the years and um, you know yeah I just we weren't ready we, we had our business operating in there we, it was a real difficulty to hardship to move um, and you know now is just a much different time for us and a different phase my father's getting a little bit older looking to do something a little bit different a little bit easier and um, it's just a good fit for us. So you know, we've been working on this in conjunction uh, with a team of people for the past, uh, I don't know, eight to 10 months. And um, we've spent a good amount of money so far. And, and we're, very, um, we're very interested in this being the next phase of what we do in our career and in our life. And, and so again, Bridgeport, this isn't just a business project for us. I mean, it is, but Bridgeport is near and dear to our heart and where we want to start uh, what we're doing here. So. That's pretty much it. That's what I wanted to say, and thank you. Appreciate it. If you have any questions, here to answer those too. I love the, <clears throat> I love seeing the site redeveloped. I always thought coming in from Upper Marion on 23, as you hit that S curve, it would just, it would be, just so welcoming to have something there that was a part of the community residentially. You know, and obviously your sites, you guys have been great with the, uh, with the warehouse there, but it would just be phenomenal to come around that corner from Upper Marion on Valley Forge Road and see. You know, something yeah, evocative of the community. Code it. We know <laughs> it's, it's a little rough in that corner. It's right? an old warehouse building. It's an old, it's, it's an old warehouse building. It is what it is in our area. Yeah. Um, but I, I'd love to see the area redeveloped. Um, are you looking at any of the adjoining parcels, like across 4th Street, um, to expand that? Is that 
Is that in the works or is that in the conversation? It, it is, and we have, and we've actually made significant offers up and above market price to the people around us. Um, they are not interested in, in selling. And uh, we even discussed buying the business across the street from us to make that happen, and they're, they're not interested at this time. So um, it is of interest to us, of great interest to us, to make it a little bit bigger. Um, you know, we love what's happened in King of Prussia. A bunch of our employees live there, actually, in the Village Town Center. We, we have an idea of some kind of vision with that. I mean, obviously, the other things that are happening in, happening in the town I think all help each other with this kind of stuff. So um, we would love to, and we've tried. We haven't gotten there yet, but time will tell. Maybe we can make something of that still. Would your intention be to keep the property and operate it? Yeah, as of, yeah, as of now, that's our okay. intention, yes. Um, I, I believe, since Geis is in Ohio, would there be anyone that's kind of local working on that? Uh, we're a national uh, developer and general contractor, design build contractor. We work in, uh, registered in 43 states across the country. Um, uh, we do have a property management arm, commercial property management and residential property management. So we would, um, I believe the intent is for us to um, manage the, the property. It is. Um, and we have, uh, would have local representation, hire you know, a local property manager for that position, local leasing. Um, and then you know, we would have local superintendent uh, you know, on boots on the ground. Uh, during construction of the project. Great. I mean, we, we've talked about, you heard before, when you have good developers or good owners who aren't from here sometimes, they're like, well, it might be nice to get the money out front, but then, then they skedaddle. Um, and, and with the, the dwelling sizes, um, since you've been developing elsewhere, is this consistent with other places? Do you have any other examples of where that's been working? Yeah, significant in, in uh, lots of different parts of the, the country. Um, coastal Carolinas, uh, South Florida, we have an office in Bonita Springs. We've done a similar, uh, similar style. And in the Midwest areas, um, Pittsburgh, uh, Cleveland, um, and other areas as well. Um, the reality is we're starting to see, uh, you know, multifamily obviously has taken a huge, huge, huge step forward. Uh, you know, it started on the coattails of 2008. People start realizing real estate, you know, and their home investment wasn't always necessarily what used to be. You know, you grew up and your parents always said, best thing, grandparents used to always say, best thing to do is always buy a home. It's your best investment. Um, and I think because of what happened on 08, you know, and, and, and the crash there um, changed that perspective. I think the, 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 I'll call it the professional living, um, people are starting to realize they want to live. They don't want to be maintaining a home. They don't want to be doing yard maintenance and upkeep. Um, you also have the empty nesters that are moving out and wanting to kind of reurbanize. Um, so the combination of all of those are, are pushing towards you know a big boost and boom uh, in the multifamily sector, um, and it creates a, a diverse uh, community within the, uh, within a building. So um, you have you know the young professionals that you know uh, are working from home, uh, especially in today's post-COVID world. That um, it's why there's such a boost for heavy amenitized, centralized public areas. They don't really necessarily want to stay all the time in their own little apartment, uh, you know, and they want to be able to get in front and have that social element. Um, so we we amenitize these buildings with significant amenities. Um, you know, in this case, there's a, a, a mid roof level terrace uh, that would allow for an amenity area um, uh, on the back side of the building um, that would allow for the residents to kind of congregate and, and meet and, and a fit, heavy fitness center, et cetera. Um, so it, it supports that all of those aspects. And it'll allow for you know families, it'll allow for young professionals, it'll allow for empty nesters. Um, so we always typically try to provide a very diverse uh, um, program of apartment sizes. Well, it's a great location. And um, like President Shank said, we've been wanting something there. And also the, the benefit, the, the other benefit for us for the development there is that the construction is kind of out of the way for the public. So it's not like, where people are going to be dealing with construction near their home, it's you know one day there won't be anything, and then one day there will be, and people wouldn't even notice the work being done in comparison to other parts of the borough where there's work being done. Not, not that we won't notice at all, but that's a benefit in, in terms. Yeah, we the, can't find everywhere. The, the natural boundaries of the site with the rail in the back, the uh, you know the residential light rail on the adjacent, you know that's elevated. Um, and then you have the overpass on the left uh, of the site here. Um, the combination that kind of creates almost its own little cluster to kind of contain um, some of that. But, uh, you know, we're excited about the opportunity. We'll keep all the dirt and ugly stuff in Upper Marion on that side of the line. 
Can you expand on the multifamily aspect just a little bit? Um, like, are they all going to be multifamily or a small portion? And then also, how does that connect with, um, like, the minimum dwelling size? Would that be, like, a, you know, a two-bedroom and a one-bedroom, or how does that work? So the, the project, um, it would be all, all multifamily, all for rent product, um, 156 units. Um, there's 10 studios of the 156. Uh, those are, I think, about 550 square feet and less. Um, and then there's 78 one bedrooms um, that are in the 717 to 630 square feet, I believe. Um, uh, I'm sorry, 800, 851 to 717 square foot size. Um, and then we have two bedrooms that are 1295 to 1,000 square foot. So does that mean there would be like a two bedroom and then like a studio connected to it? Or how does that? It'd be all individual. So no, I think the, the bedroom. Amy, the term is just for the building itself. So it's multifamily in the oh. in the building, meaning 100. Oh, not for the unit. Okay. Yeah, not the unit itself. No. Yeah, correct. Correct. Got it. Okay. <laughs> You know, just a note, and I mentioned this to Mr. Maris a couple years ago, we don't have a Bridgeport, uh, we don't have any rooftop bars in town. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> uh, do you have extra liquor licenses? <laughs> Talk to Mr. Bellow. Okay. Is there anything we need to vote on today, or is this just to look at the plan? Um, no, really, really encouraging. And, and appreciate you doing as much work ahead of time as you have before you brought it to present it here. It's a... Uh, it gives us a nice view sort of of your vision and it's not just you know a murky maybe this is what's going to happen it's something we can we can really look at yeah i also have a quick question if that's okay um so one thing that stood out to me is parking um bridgeport really has a huge issue with parking i'm not really comfortable with reducing it personally um if we do have kind of a standard um i talk to you know people all day every day and it's the major thing that comes up um, in my conversation so i know you mentioned the 50 parking spaces around um, the building. I don't know that that would be something that I'm excited to hear is like the plan B. So um, since, since this site, normally I wouldn't suggest those 50 spaces, but in this case, this is a dead end street. Um, currently the on-street parking that gets utilized for this is for the warehouse workers um, and, and employees of their current business. Again, it's a dead end street um, that, you know, is, is almost like a private drive the way that it, it, it's created. Um, so while it is on street parking, you know, you're really only parking on that street if you're functioning at one of the properties, you know, within that business. Um, and then, uh, you know, as we progress in this project and obviously as we attend a very, you know, a board of, you know, variance hearing and providing information as to the justification and hardship as to why we're presenting what we're presenting, um, we'll have national data and market research that we'll provide to describe and, um, and justify the request that we're making. Um, again, uh, when you look at unit sizes, you know, a studio unit isn't gonna set up for a family. So the chances of, you know, uh, you know multiple cars in a studio unit isn't always uh, typical. Um, small one bedrooms, you know, may have, you know, one and a significant, you know, other or someone who's staying, but for the most part. So I'm not naive to say that not everyone has a car. Um, most people do. It's that the unit sizes will justify some of the reductions. Um, and obviously, again, other boroughs, other cities have a much more reduced um, parking count requirement. It's worth noting we've contracted with the County Planning Commission recently to do a traffic study and a parking study, so we may have some actually some updated guidance coming from them. Right? That's correct. Yeah, and, I, and I don't know which direction that guidance will go, but we may have some updated guidance that's current best practices coming. Well, yeah, that's good to know. I, I was going to bring that up later in the, in the meeting, but um, I do think, one, this is the, the, the biggest parking problems in, in Bridgeport are actually on streets like mine, in residential areas, more in other places from what we've heard already. Um, but you could potentially number the spots, right? Like you could say this is for, you know, because like, we see that in other residential um, apartment or townhome communities where they say this is for house four, five, six, or whatever. That's something that you don't have a plan now, but you could potentially do something like that to make sure that every place knows that they're guaranteed a spot. Typically, uh, depending on the market, depending on you know leaseability and and what the market conditions are, we typically would create some reserve spaces that are you know uh, for rent you know purchase you know uh, in addition to their normal monthly rent. Um, so in this case, we have uh, 
86 surface parking exterior spaces that are on site, and then 104 interior structured parking spaces that are sheltered. You know, those 104 spaces would typically be, you know, a purchase monthly, you know, add on to their to their rent uh, and structure. So again, you know, when we come to the you know uh, uh, the border zoning appeal, you know, case, you know, reviewing that, we'll have markets data and information that justifies yeah, of course. it. Um, you know, uh, lots of other urban cities are going to one to one. Uh, you know, parking to unit ratios. Some are even removing parking requirements for multifamily. I understand that. I, I get what you're saying, and I understand your perspective. It's a business decision, but I, I feel like we represent the people. And what my thing also is like, what if they, someone has a party and then there's overflow and it goes into the downtown area? Then now we're we're, we're already struggling with parking. Yeah. So if we have an opportunity to increase parking, I'd much rather lean towards increasing parking. And I'm not really concerned with other cities are doing other than just like understanding it generally. Like I really want to have the people. You know, I want the people. Be represented properly, um, and I don't think that just because Philly's doing it, we should be doing it because who knows what their intentions are over there in, in general across other states uh, and towns and cities. Um, so I do think it's a priority for myself. Um, I don't speak for anyone else here, but I, I really do think that we should be pushing for better, more parking. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to speak to that, and what you're saying makes total sense. We were just talking about this at dinner tonight, um, and I was saying like even even in trying to get these occupied, you know, you need enough parking. This is a really delicate balance for us. You need enough parking. Like, I know for me, I have a condo in Wayne. I have two spots. Had I not been able to get two spots, maybe I wouldn't have been able to move in there. You know, um, so that's a really important piece. And I get we get that. The other side to this for us, and just to peel the curtain back a little bit. So, uh, we we spent. Uh, the better part of the last 10 months with using another firm to, to go through this uh, that was referred to us as you know a local couple guys and we we wasted a fortune we spent a fortune on plans and studies and surveys and going through this whole thing and and what you see is the drawing here today the building covered the entire piece of property and it was two levels of podium and the project was a complete loser. By the time we, the numbers kept getting worse and worse and worse, like the gentlemen here are talking about, these get so tight. And with the cost of construction and the way that things have been going, we said, my father and I said, well, we, we wouldn't invest our money in something like this. We, we, we couldn't. There's too much risk. You can't make any money. So they went back to the drawing board for months and tried to figure this thing out, didn't get anywhere. And I was introduced from a friend of our family to the Geises, uh, another family, the Geises. And, and they, they cracked the, the code, at least for now, on this thing, at least how to do it. There, there's other costs involved, like working with them is more cost effective for our family than it was with the last people. We cut a level of the podium parking away. We've cut this. You know, It pains me to waste good space that we have here to just use it for parking. But if we don't do that, we're going to add all these other units on top, and now the ratio gets even worse. Um, so like I was saying today, why do we have to have all this surface parking? It sucks. We want more units in here. We want to build a little bit of a bigger thing. We only have one piece of property here. Let's get the most we can out of it. Um, so the, the, to, you know, the only thing you should know about this is if we are not able to do something here within reason with the parking, it won't be a, a project. We can't do it. The parking is the linchpin to success in the project. That, that's been just giving you some some behind the and curtain. And I appreciate info the context. We, we, Thank you for we had to switch, you know, the whole thing, redo the whole thing to get to this point. And if this doesn't work, it's it would be important to figure that out sooner than later. So thanks thanks for sharing the context. Sure, no problem. But understand your point too. It's important. Yeah, and, and again, um, we aren't going to develop something uh, that creates a hardship to, you know, and a burden on the community. Uh, again, as we said, um, we are going to be the operators of this, the leasing, the property management. Yeah, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that. Yeah, I just know that we deal with it day in and day out. just want to give you context from yeah, our perspective. It's no, like understood completely. <laughs> and it's, I hate to say it, um, any multifamily project, I hate to say it, and it's the worst part about you know, our projects. Just in general, multifamily projects, the first thing you talk about is parking. And it's like, can we talk about anything other than parking? I mean, the, the project has so much more than just parking. But every time you go into a meeting, uh, the number one question is, is, is parking. Um, so again, we'll have a, a report that's provided that justifies the, the request and, and has cushion in that request because of the fact that we do not want to create a development, nor borrow, nor put, invest the equity uh, into a project that's not viable. Um, so I, we will rest assured that. 
Yeah, I, I would just say that um, location makes a big difference. So, like you said, where you are now, people aren't parking there now for any reason. Well, obviously for business, but it's like people in Bridgeport are parking there to walk around. And having residents there helps our our hopeful new businesses that will come on Fourth Street. Um, and I want to be lenient towards what businesses want to do with regard regard to parking because we want good things to come to the borough so it's not this dead space here and there. Um, but also when there was a one apartment that was going to be built on a street near me, I realized there's already hard to park as it is on my block and I got barks, uh, blocks around me so I was opposed to that because one more spot means I have to park next to someone who I consider a personal threat. So I was not in favor of doing that. And so it really depends on like one space on Ford street is a bigger hassle to some people than 10 speeds than 20 spots where you are. It's really just a matter of where you are in the borough. Yeah, I think the um, I think the overriding point though is that Bridgeport does have a historical parking issue, and um, certainly this is an isolated development. What we don't want to do is create the same problem we, there that we have throughout the rest of town, right? The, the steps that this council have been taking are trying to be to minimize that. Have you thought at all about something more aggressive parking wise than you have here, but less than what's required? Are you saying about a less of a request? Is that a yes? Uh, we feel very comfortable with the pro. We actually looked the opposite. We first looked at it from a one to one ratio, which is more closer. You know, one to one, two point five is kind of sometimes in a more, you know, urban setting, and that and and so we backed it back. You know, backed it. You know, to the one and one and a half um, that we we ended up going, so that we could have some of that cushion. Um, one thing I do want to stress is how the close proximity to public transportation that this site has, with the residential light rail right there. Um, you're right next to a major, you know, station, um, and and you know we would see that being utilized explicitly um, by residents. Other things that we put into projects, uh, rideshare programs. Um, we've had sometimes partnered with uh, a couple of different rideshare programs where you're able to uh, basically rent the car through the development um, and, and it's share, shared amongst neighbors. You know, So some people in these urban settings don't necessarily want to keep a car, uh, pay the burden of a parking space because they can go on the weekend and, and you know, rent um, you know, the car from the development. Um, through these third-party uh, programs as well, um, bike yeah. share programs, et cetera. So, yeah, I, I, I understand that, but in, in the information you gave us, you have one parking space for each efficiency and one bedroom dwelling, and one and a half parking spaces for all two bedroom units. Mm -hmm. Now, do you really believe that the two bedroom units are going to have one and a half cars? I do. Okay. And also, uh, the percentage of those are are not you know are not that. Uh, Large, I mean, so 88 units of this building are one bedrooms or studios. You know, so, uh, you know. And, and I'll, I'll restate my question. You know, perhaps you can consider something less aggressive than you have in this request, but not quite what is uh, required by the, uh, the ordinance. Unfortunately, I think what we're presenting is about where this project is on that pivot point. I would kind of question if there's any two bedroom units in Bridgeport that only have, okay, maybe not any, but there's very few, I feel like, that only have one car. Like if there's two people or a couple living there, there's most of the yeah. time there's Yeah, I mean, we're, we're getting into the statistics that, and you're gonna be accurate about the statistics, you are. The question is in this particular location, in this particular development, what, what's gonna happen there? And I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying that the statistics are definitive, uh, you know, Countrywide, but they're not necessarily tied to this particular location. No, be, I so, mean, we'll, we'll have data that shows regional calculations and regional aspects, and you know, utilizing you know the International Transportation Engineer Society's guidelines yep. for those calculations, yep. and then implementing it to the region. So, I, I promise and rest assured to the council, we will have statistical data that backs up. We're not just going to make a variance request that has you know an empty you know. No, I, un I understand. I wouldn't expect that, but I be, be conscious of the fact that parking is an issue in Bridgeport, and that anything that you can do to minimize that request would probably be more welcomed. 
I think in the eventual plan, since we're not voting on it today, is anything to demonstrate that you're encouraging non-drivers is a plus. I think it's environmentally friendly in general to be encouraging um, people to be buying an apartments and homes where they don't need a car to make it a walkable community, a train, using the train, using public transportation. And so, like you said, charging for spots, I th to me, is a positive. I would love to see people who move into these places who don't have a car because they don't need one. But that Bridgeport's a place where you can walk to eat, you can walk to get um, the things you need, get an Uber for things, go to the train, et cetera. Um, so anything in your plan that demonstrates that we're going to be discouraging people from getting a spot altogether, I think is great and maybe be a reference for future development as well because uh, that, that's something we should want is less people, people needing less cars. And I, in general yeah understood and we will we will come and provide that detail you know and you know to this commission when we come back with kind of the final final plans to to get for actual vote and approval um i will say full transparency that if uh this project only pencils with this type of a variance request for um the parking requirement uh, a two to one uh, puts too much of a burden on a second level of podium, which you know basically makes this project infeasible, which would basically just eliminate it from happening. We, I would want to point out that in your conversion aspect of the code, it does allow for one unit per bedroom or one car per bedroom, which is what we're following. We're following that, but it's not a conversion, it's a ground up. Now, I'm going to make that same case to you that I know we're tearing a building down, but in retrospect, we are converting and redeveloping this site. So while it's not a true definition of what the code is, there is precedent in your code to allow for a redevelopment of an existing building. Uh, in this case, it's a teardown and then a re reconstruction of an existing building. But in that situation, you do have a one car per bedroom requirement, which is what we're proposing. You did mention too. You you're looking for zoning relief on the use and not a rezoning. Correct. Okay. What's the what's your argument there? It's a good question. We're going to work on that. Okay. <laughs> Are there any other uh, questions from council regarding the plan? I think we're all open to hearing it. I mean, it sounds so negative about the parking. We're just, we get a lot of people hounding us about it, so we got to make sure. No, understood. And uh, let's be honest, at the end of the day, uh, you guys approve something, we build it, we'll be here for the operation thereof. But when you start getting citizen complaints, they look to you guys like the, you know, uh, yeah. with, with the pitchforks of saying, how did this happen? Um, so we and understand that as operators to buildings and structures, that what we present needs to be able to be functional. Um, because it's detrimental to the city and also the borough and then also to the project. Right, and please don't take my comments to be opposed or for your application. I absolutely believe, we had opportunity to meet at my office some time ago, and I believe the development of that parcel would be wonderful for Bridgeport. So uh, it just, there has to be some things we, did, we need to discuss, that's all. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Yep, thank Certainly you. appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on for council consideration. Uh, adoption of an amended sexual misconduct policy to the non-uniform personnel handbook. Uh, members of council, um, as we do every spring, uh, we uh, recently, as of March 31st, uh, re-upped with, um, you know, re-upped our umbrella and property premises, uh, liability insurance packages. And periodically we get feedback from our carrier um, regarding uh, certain aspects of our policy. And from time to time they make you know, certain, uh, certain mandates. And uh, one of the uh, requirements that our carrier uh, is, uh, wishes to impose upon us is a more strengthened or more comprehensive uh, sexual misconduct and molestation policy. Uh, we do have in our current uh, non-uniform uh, employee personnel handbook uh, a why, what I consider to be a pretty thorough um, anti-sexual harassment uh, provision. Uh, however, 
the uh, the carrier uh, saw, I guess, in, in their estimation, some uh, some holes or some some topics that were not covered, um, and therefore I pulled some samples from not only the carrier but some other adjacent municipalities, um, and drafted a new uh, revised uh, sexual misconduct section. Uh, ran it past Labor Council, ran it past the carrier. Uh, both seem to be satisfied with the language as it uh, currently is. And therefore, I uh, present it to you tonight for uh, consideration of adoption. All right, I think it's important to stay up to date on those, so I will uh, make the motion. I'll, I will second. We have a uh, motion from Ms. High, seconded by Mr. Fee, to adopt the amended sexual misconduct policy. Questions or comments from council or the public on that? I'm just reviewing it. Now. Well, we're not voting. Are we voting to adopt it? Or, okay, because I was just, because it wasn't a resolution, so I was sorry. Um, I'm just looking at it in detail. And um, based on what's written here, does that also include, like, if things are on someone's computer that's inappropriate and people walk by, like, seeing that? I just couldn't tell from the language, and that, that covers that? Yes. Uh, not only, uh, I, I think a combination of this policy uh, in unison with um, our, our cyber security policies and, and use of uh, you know, municipal uh, computers and you know, IT products, yeah, I think we have a pretty comprehensive uh, coverage overall now. Great. I just want to make sure we're as comprehensive as possible since we're doing it. So. Thank any other questions or comments on the amended uh, the amended language policy? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that's unanimous, thank you. Uh, moving on for council consideration, uh, advertisement of ordinance 2023-4 regulating the operation of massage parlors in Bridgeport Borough. And you know, in retrospect, um, had I realized Chief Beretta wouldn't be here tonight, and may, I may have forestalled the vote on this, but um, just so he could elaborate a little further because this is a document that, um, that uh, Chief uh, spearheaded. Um, I know that um, both Chief Beretta and our code enforcement department, um, the police department and our code enforcement department are, um, you know, vigilant and always concerned to, uh, to make sure that uh, any massage parlors or similar industry that opens up in town um, are, have the pr appropriate standards of integrity and uh, propriety and there aren't, uh, you know, uh, clandestine operations going on there. Um, and I know that uh, code enforcement and the police department have discussed uh, the new procedure that would be, uh, that would be adopted if uh, ordinance, uh, the ordinance here uh, for your consideration uh, does in fact get uh, ratified. Um, I, I know that Chief Beretta pulled this uh, document from another uh, adjacent municipality. I believe it may have even been Tradifferin, his uh, his previous employer, uh, and they have been able to use it to uh, combat uh, similar concerns that I think you know most municipalities share. So you know, with that, I would uh, I would certainly you know uh, turn it over to council and and ask them to uh, consider allowing us to proceed with. Uh, advertising the ordinance um, with the knowledge that code enforcement and the police department are on the same page insofar as uh, the way we move forward from here in terms of monitoring uh, any uh, anomalies that, that might come into town. No, I know uh, this is something Chief Brett brought up a couple a couple months ago, so this isn't just off the cuff and they put some thought into drafting. I'm, I'm comfortable with being on the agenda even though he's not here. This is just a vote to advertise. So if there's some sort of change that anybody were to come up with or if Chief would have second thoughts, we'll obviously have another vote at our, at our next meeting to ratify. I, I'd just like to add, uh, 
this is something that we had talked about. Um, this stems from the Montgomery County Chiefs, like their general committee as a whole. Um, it might have been an issue in another township somewhere. Um, this is something that he wanted to take as a preventative measure so we don't have these issues, but it, I don't think it stems from anything that has happened here. It's just something that it seems to be the trend that he's trying to be proactive on. I think that's an accurate assessment. I'll make a motion to advertise. I'll second. Motion from Mr. Ohio, seconded by Ms. Gundrum to advertise the ordinance regarding massage parlors in the borough. Questions or comments from council or the public on that one? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, that is unanimous. Thank you. All right, very good. Uh, moving on for council consideration, a use request from Growing Bridgeport Together uh, in connection with the Holiday Shopping Village. And I see that Mr. Gundrum is here. I don't know if he wants to step forward and uh, make any comments, but in addition to the presence of Mr. Gundrum in your packets, you will uh, find a request letter from Growing Bridgeport Together uh, relating to um, the annual request that's made to utilize the Borough Hall parking lot. And Mr. Gundrum, you're at the podium. Take it away. Um, well, I just want to thank Council for considering uh, this request. And as, as has happened in the past years, uh, uh, we've run the Holiday Shopping Village where we get uh, local vendors involved and have them just come out and um, share what they have with the, with, with the public and be a um, event for the, b the borough. Um, in tandem with everything else that's going on for Small Business Saturday. That, that's pretty much it. And this would just be a, uh, a vote to approve that use request. Yes, okay. All right. Well, we've done this in the past. I think it's worked well in combination with the Festive Lights because it doesn't conflict. I think it complements other things going on that day. So I will make a motion to approve the request. I'll second. We love coming. Thank you for having it and running it. And Motion from, oh, before yes, Before we Ms. get Gunner. to a vote, I, am, I will recuse myself from this. And you provided something in, uh, in writing? I have. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Gundrum. Uh, so we have a motion from Mr. Heil, seconded by Ms. Alzaed, regarding the uh, Shopping Village use request. Questions or comments from council or the public on that one? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. That's unanimous as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gundrum. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Gundrum. Uh, moving forward, for council consideration, a curb cut request at 443 Depot Street. Members of council, in your packets, you will find a memorandum dated June 6th from Building Code Official Wanzik uh, that states uh, the owner of, name redacted, the owner of 443 Depot Street has requested a curb cut to the rear of his property. Upon a review of the request and a site visit, I recommend approval. Uh, if approved, he has agreed to apply for all applicable permits and com comply with the borough's subdivision and land development ordinance. Please see attached request. And you will see that um, Mr. Uh, well, I guess there's no reason to redact the name. Mr. Beckett here, the property owner, uh, is uh, requesting approval for a curb cut at the rear of his property. Um, I believe this is in uh, in conjunction with the, uh, the with the aesthetic of the uh, the rest of this block. Uh, there are other uh, adjacent homeowners that have um, rear alleyway driveways, and uh, this property owner wishes to do the same. And I certainly don't see any reason to deny him. I'll make a motion to. Uh to approve the request. I'll second. Motions from Mr. Heil, seconded by Ms. Nolan to approve the curb cut at 443 Depot. Questions or comments from council or the public on the curb cut request? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, that's unanimous, thank you. All right, thank you. Next up for council consideration, a fee waiver request Bridgeport Elementary Roof Repair and the 
requested amount of uh, to be waived, the permit cost would be $12,419.50 in your packets, members of council. You will find the building permit application as well as the request letter from Robert Malkowski, Director of Operations for UMASD. Um, you know, in, in the past, the um, elected officials, or I should say Borough Council, has uh, considered uh, permit uh, cost waivers for the school district, and um, you have another one before you this evening. That's pretty substantial. I mean, not that I'm... It is. Do you know uh, when they expect to, to start the construction? I do not have a... I'd be lying if I said I had a concrete date, uh, President Shank, but um, I believe it is imminent. Just, just based on the sign again, I, obviously the school needs to do what the school needs to do, but just based on the sum is maybe we could, are there some repairs up there? I'm thinking parking lot. Uh, I don't know what it costs to pave the portion of the parking lot up there that, that I, do, I do know needs some work, but maybe we could, uh, to, uh, maybe we could ask that they cut some money towards a, a project like that that's also going to benefit the, uh, the park area up there. I don't know, I'm just throwing some things out. I, I'm used to seeing these fee waiver requests come through, but I'm not used to seeing five digits on them. Yeah, well, you know, our, the, the reason it's so big is our, our building permits are, um, are cost-based. They're factored in by cost, and the cost of this job is just short of $825,000, so um, pretty, uh, pretty significant. You know, obviously, a very large structure. Um, I mean, that said, if it's an $800,000 project, the $12,000 is not going to make or break the project. I, I agree with you, President Shane. And I don't want to get greedy, and I don't think the council does either, but maybe there's something up there that we could redirect some or all of that portion to that would be of benefit to the district and the borough. Have we historically waived all their their fees? Uh, you know, I, I can't speak for anything that's happened prior to 2016, Councilwoman High, but generally speaking, borough council, when when asked for a fee waiver, from a school or a church, they typically do grant it. It's a large fee, but on the other hand, it's a t it's the same taxpayers are paying for it. So, I mean, if you were dispersing the fee to the taxpayers, it would be the taxpayers of Bridgeport paying. It's robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's not really. Well, it'll be the, it would be the entire district. Yeah. Money for the, I mean, and given that we're. No, I. Percent of the district, it would be, uh, I, I'm just. If it's a, if it, and, and again, it's Bridgeport Elementary. Bridgeport kids go there. We, uh, we want to recognize that, but it's just a substantial sum, and it's an $800,000 project, maybe. I, I guess I'm, I'm just throwing ideas around. Is there something mutual up there that we could ask them to uh, I, I direct could, those monies? I could tell you that historically, the maintenance of that parking lot has been hotly disputed. And, you know, I wonder, I wonder what their intentions are with regard to that parking lot up there. I mean, certainly they utilize it. Um, and they've utilized it since the inception. Um, they utilized the park facilities as well since the inception. So I don't think, uh, you know, waiving, uh, waiving the money, you certainly have a right to do that. Uh, and just taking the money, I think that would be the worst of the options. But if there's some mutual benefit that uh, needs to be done that the borough can benefit from as well as the, uh, the school, I mean, it's certainly something that's at least worth conversation, if not with regard to this particular waiver request, but with regard to their intentions going forward, because I've never in my tenure heard anybody suggest that they have any obligation to maintain that parking lot or the park despite the use. So I think it's a legitimate question. And if I, I normally I see these fee waivers and I think a hundred bucks, I think a thousand bucks. I, I just didn't notice the five digit number there. Um, I, I believe we, uh, within the last 12 months, we granted another similar uh, request from the school district. I believe it was about $8,400, $8,500, so it didn't break that five-digit okay. barrier, but it was, uh, <laughs> it too was sizable. Again, I'm just speaking, would council be all right with going back and asking if maybe they could redirect 
this sum towards something that's you know also of benefit to the the borough or the the folks that use the park up there before we approve it, kick it around. I should have I should have seen this and gotten ahead of it um, with well, this idea, but I'm just thinking about it now. I don't know about redirect it because it's. I mean, but we can if there's a specific request about the parking lot or something like that. I think that's an okay request, but just if we give you if you re, um, reduce twelve thousand dollars, we have twelve thousand dollars back. That's kind of. Oh sure, no. I, I mean, I mean, definitely, you're marking it for something of of benefit to the public up there, not just we take it back and now we have it in our general fund. No, I understand, but it's not really because it's not money that's being earmarked. It's just money they're not paying. So it's it's not like we're giving them twelve thousand dollars. It's just that we're waiving a fee. Yeah, but the question is, should they be giving us money for the parking lot? Should they be repairing the parking lot? That's different. And if they and if they should be, because they're utilizing it and they need it to be a school there, then they have some obligation to pay for something at some point in time. No, that, that's you know, and they haven't paid anything, to my understanding, since the inception of the of the school, which is how many years now? It's long enough to need an entire new roof. No, that's a different. That's a different thing. I just yeah. like. Um, saying, well, because like I said, we're, we're waiving potential money, not giving them $12,000. I think if we go back and say, hey, we're inclined to agree, but before we do so, can you clear up the usage of this parking lot? Or you, you would get the language better, but just so it's not necessarily a monetary. It is monetary, but it's more about can we clear some of this up to help the residents? And, and just to be clear, from my perspective, I, I don't know that this is the time to, to have that argument or conversation. I'm just suggesting to you that that conversation has to happen. It has not happened. That lot needs to be repaired. They used the, that. They got approved by the state of Pennsylvania because of that parking, because of that park use that they have in addition to the parking, and there's been no improvements made since the inception of the school. So this might not be the time, but sometime soon I, I would encourage council to, to make this an issue. I, I know that we've I know that conversation has been around for years. I, I, I would just throw it out there, Council, maybe we do have another meeting come up in two weeks. Um, maybe we can hold on this and just have a conversation and see what can be done about the, the status of the parking lot up there before we take that vote. So I'll make a motion, even though I'm generally in favor, to table the motion until the next meeting with the understanding that Mr. Truman will reach out to the school district to at least begin that conversation um, so that they know we're expecting something, some clarification, because we have been talking about that for, since I've been here, and, so, and obviously longer. So I think that's up there. So make a motion to table with that understanding. I'll second that motion. So the motion from Mr. Heil and seconded by uh, Ms. High is to table, uh, table the issue of the fee waiver request for the elementary school. Uh, questions or comments on that motion from Council of the Public? All right, seeing none, all those in favor of that? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, we're going to table that to the next meeting. Thanks. And Mr. Heil, thank you for, uh, for walking through that. Mr. President? Please, sir. Hey, I, I would, uh, Mr. Bellow triggered a memory from back when. The oh, no, watch out. Was, uh, <laughs> it's hard when you get to be my age, I know. Um, but I would suggest, Mr. Truman, that you look at the approval of that site. There's, there's something that I have a vague recollection that was tied to what Mr. Bellows' comments were about that actually was part of the approval of that site. There, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, a maintenance aspect, a park maintenance aspect of it. Upper uh, Marion is um, supposed to uh, perform the landscaping of, you know, at least the, the, the grass cutting and not necessarily up on the ball fields, but um, the rest of the green area, the rest of the grassy areas, uh, the hillside and everything that's not uh, playground or ball field. Um, and yes, we can certainly, we can certainly broach this conversation uh, with, the, with the school district. And, and I'll take a look back through my files too, Mr. Bellow too. I, I, I think it may have been, whether it went as far as a condition of approval or not, I don't, I don't know that for a fact, but I can certainly check the archives. Well, I have specific recollection that the use of the park and to be able to walk to that park was required by the state of Pennsylvania because there was not enough room on the site to have enough activities. That is correct, yes. Yeah. 
And then so uh, I would just comment, too, for the record, that they were cutting the grass for a long period of time. And for some reason, that just stopped. They, uh, they still do some uh, on, on a kid when, when, when the wind's blowing in the right direction. Well, Mr. Wood, Mr. Bellow, thanks for the, uh, the uh, historical. No. And Mr. Truman, thanks for following up on that. We'll, we'll talk about it at the next meeting. Uh, next up, for council consideration, approval of purchase of a belt filter press control panel for the sewer plant. The price tag on it would be $63,878. Uh, members of council, uh, at your, uh, well, in the packets, uh, you know, in, in front of you at the dais, you will see a cost estimate from Envirodyne Systems Incorporated. Um, the belt filter press is a device uh, that is located within the sewer plant. Uh, it's part of the treatment process. It helps extrude um, solids from liquids at the sewer plant, and I won't go into any further detail beyond that. Um, the control panel is obviously the brain or the, the, the control center for this machine. It has been um, held together with um, good old ingenuity for, uh, for many, for, for, for the last few years now. It's, it's, it's at the end of its, expect, its life expectancy. Uh, this is a budgeted expense in, the, uh, in this year's capital budget. I was actually in uh, the last uh, the last couple of capital budgets, but for varying reasons, COVID, supply chain issues, what have you, uh, it has uh, it's been delayed for a couple of years. Um, after meeting with uh, the electrician and electrician a month or so ago to perform uh, what was in his estimation the very last repair that he is thinks he's capable of or willing to. Uh, do on the control panel, uh, it's time to, uh, to move forward with the purchase of a new control panel. Uh, you see uh, right below Envirodyne's you know, business signature at the top, the header, you see the blue co-stars insignia there as well. Uh, that means that uh, Envirodyne is part of the Pennsylvania uh, consortium for you know, cooperative bidding. Um, meaning they provide what is a, uh, a price vetted by the Harrisburg uh, to be a fair competitive uh, lowest price. Therefore, we can bypass the, uh, the typically obligatory bidding system and go with CoStars with the knowledge that the state of Harrisburg has vetted the price for us. Um, furthermore, we have obtained quotes from local uh, electricians to perform the installation of it, uh, of this machine or of this piece of equipment. Um, we also we have a, uh, a cost estimate of eight thousand five hundred and seventy-five dollars for the actual uh, electrician work labor for uh, for install installing it. Uh, the other quotes were both above ten thousand dollars, so obviously the eighty-five hundred dollar one's going to win out there as well. Um, however, this vote in particular would be for the purchase, the capital purchase of the belt filter press control panel. And Mr. Wood, I don't know if you have any anything you'd like to add. You summed it up very well, Mr. Truman. I could bore you to detail for a long time, but I won't. Well, we've have. Um, we were able to have a full capital budget this year. Um, we, well, we don't want to spend the money, but we can't. We need to. So I will make a motion to approve the purchase. A second. Motions for Mr. Heil and seconded by Ms. Gunn to approve the purchase of the belt filter press control panel. Additional questions or comments from council or the public on that? Um, does something like this come out of the general fund or the sewer fund? Uh, this would come out of the capital fund, the capital budget. Uh, got it. Additional questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that's approved, thank you. Thank you, which for, for further clarification, Councilwoman High, the capital fund is funded and replenished by surplus revenues we receive from both the sewer and the general fund. All 
All right, very good. Moving on to unfinished business. Are there any items of unfinished business? Uh, seeing none, we can proceed to committee. Maybe an item of unfinished business is taking unfinished business off the agenda. We'll discuss. Uh, That's new business. <laughs> that, would, that would be new business, wow. and we haven't advertised it. Um, committee reports. Are there any committee reports to share this evening? Uh, just a quick update from the Community Events Committee. We have our carnival coming up uh, this month, June 20th to the 24th. Right, that's right. Next, oh my God, is it? <laughs> Time flies. Um, we have four great bands coming to play. We'll have our uh, beer and wine garden. Um, and hopefully lots of great new brides. So we encourage everyone to come out. Um, yes, we are looking for volunteers. If anyone can uh, give up a night or two and come out, we would love to have some people help with ticketing and security and such. Um, and then also we will be having our second movie night on June 17th. Uh, we will be showing Jumanji at sunset right here at Borough Hall. So we hope to see you guys out. I think that's it for the events committee. Thanks. Thank you, Councilwoman. Hi. Not part of the events committee, but this um, the 24th Saturday is the uh, borough-wide yard sale. So that's also coming up shortly. Thank you. All right. Uh, seeing no further committee reports, we can proceed to the mayor's report. Mayor Jack Sear. Thank you. I uh, just got a few things this evening. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone who attended the annual Memorial Day service on May 29th. It was a beautiful observance and a great way of honoring those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. On June 1st, I have the honor of attending the West Conshohocken Pride flag raising event. It's always an exciting event because I believe that everybody should be able to have pride in who they are. And to celebrate for the entirety of June, I have a pride flag up in the office of my window here at Borough Hall for anyone who happens to pass by at any time of day or night. Last week, I was able to support the Norristown Library, which happens to be our home library, for their annual June Jazz fundraising event. And this event helps to support their book budget for the year. And as you all likely know, I'm a pretty huge advocate for literacy in our community. And if you weren't aware, they hold an excellent summer reading program each year. And if you sign your child up on their website, with the, uh, they have a Beanstack app this year. Um, kids are going to be able to earn badges, win prizes, and submit an entry to name the library's newest bumblebee mascot. It's very cute. I recommend you uh, have them submit a name. And finally, I'll be hosting my monthly office hours in my office on the first floor of Borough Hall on Thursday, June 29th from 6.30 to 8 o'clock p.m. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, moving on to new business. Are there any items of new business to discuss this evening? Uh, Mr. Truman, uh, we had a planning meeting, I didn't count it as committee report last week, um, where we were talking about um, parking issues to, uh, in, for the business community, um, alleviating parking issues in some different ways, uh, making it easier um, to make Bridgeport a walkable community. And one thing that came up was beautifying our sidewalks and making it a more attractive place to walk around as new businesses and homes come in. I'd like to suggest um, a council-directed borough arts program and see if you can help me develop that in the next few weeks, maybe at the July meeting or August meeting, um, to get volunteers. We need some volunteer buy-in to do this. It would not be council members doing it. It would be volunteers of the community um, doing things like painting sidewalks or different kinds